wonder whether you've ever had the experience of being on a sports team that is losing heavily. Okay, perhaps you went into the game with high hopes. Uh, you thought you'd win. In fact, you thought possibly it would be a walkover, but you've been in for a terrible shock. Uh, you're being absolutely hammered. Imagine how you would feel as perhaps half time approaches and you're, you're being thrashed. Maybe you'd be feeling very weary, disgraced, pretty dark and down, desolate and in ruins, fearing the mocking and reproach of your rivals and their friends. But then your player manager, who's only been able to kind of offer encouragements from the sidelines so far, he gets you into the dressing room for his half-time team talk. And more than that, he prepares himself to come on for the second half. He has that word, just that right word, to sustain the weary. He fronts up and stands up to take the abuse. Suddenly, he himself is light, and the way, and the truth, and the life. And he's assured of, of ultimate victory. There's a, there's a game plan, he tells you. But the opposition is going to crumble and, and fade away uh, eventually, while well, you are going to be vindicated. Uh, you will live and, and will last forever. So you may have noticed that probably my language there was a bit exaggerated, moving kind of beyond a sports game scenario, because that's the kind of language we actually find in the section of the Bible that we're going to be looking at this morning, Isaiah chapter 50 and verses 4 through to the next chapter, chapter 51 and verse 8. And as we saw, that was on page 738 of the church Bibles. The backdrop is one of a weary people. You see that in verse 4. Of ones who walk in the dark, verse 10. Verse 3 of chapter 51 are in ruins, like a desert, a a wasteland. Verse 7, fear the reproach of people and are terrified of their insults. It's a people, the nation of Israel, who had expected to win, who thought that they were the favoured ones of God. But that had just led to arrogance and then going seriously off script and game plan. And as a result, they are being hammered. They're they're facing exile and and near annihilation at the hands of the Babylonians. And life beyond that, even though they would return to their land and be set free, it looked pretty bleak and desolate. Now none of that exile and military defeat has actually happened when the words that we're reading were written. In fact, the people were living quite arrogantly, hadn't really clocked the dire situation they were in. No matter how many own goals they had let in, as it were, they were still cocky, they were thought thought they were on the winning side. But disaster is coming. And the prophet Isaiah, who wrote these words, is is looking a hundred years or more into the future and inspired by God, is is writing and recording how history is going to unfold, the way things will turn out. And he's putting himself, as it were, in the future with all the discouragements, with all the discouragements and disappointments that would be faced, even after returning from exile. And from that perspective, he's giving what feels like a half-time team talk. Uh, It begins in in chapter 4, chapter 50, and verses 4 to 9, with what we could call the introduction of a super sub. Uh, At half-time in history, 
God's chosen one, his servant, his Messiah, will come onto the field. Indeed, in these opening verses, as uh, Steve said at the beginning of the reading, this, this super sub, God's servant himself, is the one who is speaking in the first person without really introducing himself. It's not until he stops speaking in in verse 10 that we're told that these are the words of God's servant. But in these words, he foretells something of what is going to happen to him and the light and the change and the hope that he will bring for the second half. After this, in in verses 10 and 11 of chapter 50, uh, the, the team talk continues with a real rallying cry getting us to consider our response to this sermon uh, to this uh, servant whether we'll get ourselves in the game and and trust and and follow this servant or whether we'll continue to blaze our own path to inevitable defeat the talk then continues in the next chapter chapter 51 and verses 1 to 8 with The coach reminding us of the big picture game plan. That the second half is still going to be difficult and at times discouraging. It's going to be an uphill battle. But one that will lead to ultimate victory and vindication at the end of the game. At the end of the world. And of course we're reading this passage today as those, as it were, who were living at some point during the second half. That the servant Jesus has come. And the second half game plan that we're told about is being played out. And with that, we continue to face difficulties and discouragements. Maybe we've entered life thinking that things are going to go well. And we feel like we're being happy. Maybe we enter the Christian life thinking that things were going to go well and smoothly, that we'd be the good people we want to be, that we wouldn't have any problem with sin anymore, that we wouldn't suffer. And we're finding out that even though Jesus has come, we still sin frequently and horribly. And we still suffer again frequently and sometimes horribly. And so we need to to take notice. We need to take heart from this, as it were, half-time team talk that we're given here as much as the Old Testament people of Israel. So let's start to to look at verses 4 to 9 of uh, of chapter 15 and and the coming onto the field of this super sub. And he is a super sub because he represents the kind of servant people that the nation of Israel should have been. But in their arrogance, they weren't. And so he's not so much going to to play the game with them in the second half as to stand in for them, as to to represent them, as to be a substitute for them. Uh, The picture that we're given in in, in verses 4 and 5 is of an ideal disciple, a learner, a servant who is taught by their master, listens to their master, passes on the message of their master, and is obedient and faithful in all things to their master. Israel should have been that, but we should be this. Jesus was and is the Sovereign Lord, it says, has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. No one speaks words of hope and life like Jesus does. Words he hears and receives from his Father as he as he sits, as it were, attentive and prayerful, morning by morning. 
And Jesus isn't just a hearer. He's a doer of these things as well. He lives out from his heart with overflowing love and comfort and grace these words that he has received from his Father. Are you a a, a disciple who is hearing, who is listening to Jesus as he speaks words of life and hope, words that do sustain the weary, words that come from and reflect the Father's heart, words that have substance because they've been lived out in love, even as we're going to see now in the face of horrible opposition and ridicule and abuse. Now, the servant says of himself in verse 6, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheek to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. This is where love took the Lord Jesus. This obedient servant, this ideal disciple, willingly faced the mistreatment of those who hated him, those who ultimately would come to kill him. And he did this to save his people from their sins, from our own folly and rebellion. This is pointing us to Jesus being the ultimate super son. Uh, the person who would take the place and and stand in for his messed up, falling short teammates. The one who actually deserves this mistreatment. We who deserve that. We who ultimately deserve the death that Jesus faced. The servant Jesus could do this willingly and courageously because, verse 6, the sovereign Lord helps me. Knowing as such, I will not be disgraced. And that seems to be an allusion to the resurrection. How after Jesus was cruelly treated and mocked and ultimately killed, God helped him. He he vindicated him by raising him up from the grave alive and exonerated from all the abuse and false charges that he had willingly taken on himself. And Jesus knew that this was the game plan ahead of time. And so knowing that he wouldn't ultimately be disgraced, but indeed would be highly honoured, he says, therefore have I set my face like old and hard and determined and no I will not be put to shame because he who who vindicates me is near is able as it were to mock his mockers in verses 8 and 9 who then will bring charges against me let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them. It's challenging. He's warning those who will beat him, who will pull out the hairs of his beard, he will spit in his face. He, he, he's willingly allowing himself to be mistreated as the super sub, standing in for those of his teammates who have messed up and really are the ones who deserve that. But ultimately, he's not going to be left there. He's going to be vindicated. He's going to be raised from the dead. And those insults and death threats will be seen as senseless with all who persist in hurling them at him being pictured as just some old clothes that will wear out will be eaten or mocked and destroyed 
they and their insults are going to vanish away. For Jesus will indeed reign and, and, and remain in glory and great splendor. And perhaps if you're familiar with the Bible, the way that these verses here are written might be reminding you of some more words elsewhere that are very similar. Words from that lovely Romans 8 passage. In my Bible, in, in Romans 8 uh, and verse 31 through to verse 39, it's given the heading, more than conquerors. Uh, and echoing these Isaiah verses, verses 33 and 34 of Romans 8 say, who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who will condemn? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who has been raised to life, is at the right hand of God and also interceding for us. We have this super son. There are charges that normally would stick against us. That there are plenty of things that, that people could condemn us for. And yet because, uh, and if, Jesus has taken those charges and he's been condemned in our place, facing the, the mocking and, and the mistreatment that we read of back in Isaiah, then because he has borne that, because he's died on the cross, because He's been raised again. He's exonerated. He's vindicated. He's been glorified by his Father. And so will we. We will not be charged and condemned because we are a part of him. We are in him. He is our super son. He died. He's been raised. Now he is at the right hand of God, interceding for us, where he tells us that he's, he's pleading on our behalf. And as those verses in Romans 8 go on to say, nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We're, we're more than confidence because of anything that we because we are united by faith to our super sub, Jesus Christ, who has done it. And having pointed us to this, uh, the team talk back in Isaiah chapter 50, so it where it reaches the high point of uh, uh, verses 10 and 11 with this rousing, rallying cry from the coach. Who among you? fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant. Let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. But now, all you who light fires and provide yourself with flaming torches, go, walk in the light of your fires, and of the torches that you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. As I say, in the, in the second half, after, after Jesus has come, we may still feel that we're walking in the dark. But we can become discouraged. And, and, and repeatedly sin. We can, we can suffer. We can think that we are being hammered. Perhaps even that we are on the losing team. We might wonder whether Christianity is all it is cracked up to. Are, are we supposed to be new creations with all things being made new? Are, aren't we supposed to be enjoying life and, and life to the full? How comes we still sin so? How comes we're so wronged and, and, and suffer so much? How comes we feel so small 
are an insignificant and we feel we're in the dark we feel despondent when like this sports team we, we feel that we're on the end of a hammer near it in ruins perhaps facing mocking and ridicule for calling ourselves a Christian we have a choice that there's a real temptation in that darkness to light our own fire our own flaming torch to try and find our own way out of the hard times our own coping strategies that that make out that we're strong, that we're the solution. Or maybe as we find living as a Christian heart, we'll think that we can lower the standards, that we can change what God says is best and what we think is best, what, what feels easier, not so hard, not so humble. We're all prone to do this. When I get overwhelmed and feel that my back is against the wall. The, the torch that I light is to try and do a mixture of both working extra hard and ignoring deadlines and ignoring people that I don't want to face. When I'm busy, I stupidly think that that's the time that I don't need to talk to and I don't need God. And indeed, I don't need to talk to and I don't need other people. And so I don't ask for help from God or from other people. I don't ask whether certain tasks can be put back or whether other people might be able to help out and do some of the tasks that I face. I just bury my head in my way. Think that I am the solution. I am my own savior. Doing what I think I can and avoiding what I can't do, avoiding deadlines, avoiding people I don't want to face. And sadly, if we, if we play with fire, we're likely to get burned. If we light our own torches, if we follow our own ways and our own wisdom, we make ourselves out to be strong and the solution. God will often say, Walk in the light of your fires and the, the torches that you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torments. Often we experience the, the, the painful consequences of our choices and, and we follow that path stubbornly to its bitter. who time and time again saves us from our own stupidity, saves us from ourselves. And he's calling on us. He, he's teaching us. Even when we're in the darkest of situations, he, he's giving us this rallying cry. Trust in the name of the Lord and rely on our God. He, he asks us, who among you fears the Lord and obeys the words of his son. In the darkness, in, in the most disappointing, difficult times of life, there especially, we have to be growing and cultivating a fear of the Lord. That, that sense that he is big, he is sufficient. I small. He's the one who can be relied on and trusted. Not me. That's the that's what the Bible calls that fear of the Lord. That's that's the beginning of wisdom. The beginning of us getting it, of, of us growing in that skill and ability to, to live life well, to, to navigate life safely with all its pitfalls and problems. To actually flourish and prosper even in adversity. As we recognize the reality that we are small and weak, and yet God is strong and 
and great, as we grow in an ever dependent, deepening walk and relationship with Him. That's the, that's the rallying cry. Who among us fears the Lord and obeys the word of His servant? to encourage us still further. This halftime talk ends with a reminder of the big picture game plan. What God is doing in this world. How, how despite all the darkness and difficulties that he will ensure final victory and the vindication of us his people that we were right and are right to be following him. When so many others are are lighting their own torches and going down their own paths to the street. And it starts in, in verse 1 of chapter 51 with this call to listen to me. You who pursue righteousness, salvation, and who seek the Lord. And you remember that, that God's servant, Jesus, back at the start of this passage, was the ideal listener, the ideal disciple. He was one ready to receive instruction. That he was woken each morning to hear something more, to have that, that well instructed tongue that was able to sustain the world. And that's the attitude, that's the, that's the ear that all of us as, as Jesus' disciples are to have. An ear to hear, to, to listen, to receive instruction from, from outside of us, from, from God himself. And he begins in verse 1 by telling us to, to look to the rock from which you were hewn. And he explains what he means by that in verse 2. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth. When I called him, he was only one man, and I blessed him and made him many. Abraham, you probably know, was the, the founding father of the nation of Israel. He, he was the, the rock from which that nation had been quarried and, and dug out. But he wasn't a big, impressive rock. Some, some jewel or, or gem, some great millstone or hefty foundation stone. He was more like a tiny pebble, a noble. And yet God had made out of him a great nation. Yet indeed had made him a father of many nations, not just the Israel. And God, it says it in verse 3, is, is telling his people this to, to comfort and to encourage them. Looking, looking forward in history, the nation of Israel and its people would end up in ruins. It, it's a picture of them being like a desert, like a, like a wasteland, flattened and buried. And it's pointing forward to the time of exile and beyond that when they return to the land and yet it still looks bleak and desolate. And yet the God who founded the nation from insignificant Abraham says he will have compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden the wasteland like the garden of the Lord. Restoring them in this pictorial language to, to how things were at the very beginning of creation when, when God made the paradise garden of Eden for, for mankind to live in. And unsurprisingly, where once there was despair and dejection, there will be joy and gladness, thanksgiving, and a sound of singing. And more than this, verse 4, the nation would be a beacon of light to the Gentiles. 
house, a, a place of instruction and, and the upholding of justice. And, and the promise is, verse 5, that this, my righteousness, draws near speedily. And, and I love this, this next phrase. My salvation is on the way, God says. That my justice will become a light to the nation. Now, of course, this has echoes of the verse that Steve was, was focusing in on last week, back in chapter 49 and, uh, and verse 6, where, where God was saying it was too small a thing just to restore the nation of Israel, but he promised back there, I will also make you a light to the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the end. This is the, the big picture purpose that God is about. That the game plan that is now being worked out in the second half. Start small. Insignificant. Even now it doesn't seem much. But there is this growing and expanding as the gospel goes out to all the nations of the world. As Jesus says it in Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. And we're told of the end coming in Isaiah 51 here, back in verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will not fail. This salvation is bigger than just the, the physical nation of Israel and, and those who, who biologically and ethnically descend from Abraham. Through Jesus, a, a true Jew, the servant who embodies everything that that nation should have been, the line of Abraham and, and the nation of Israel now includes people from all nations. It, it is no longer a biological, ethical connection, an ethnic connection to, to Abraham that's important. It's a spiritual one that comes through that faith connection, that union that we have with Jesus. And so we are all part of the nation. And with that, the promises and these great purposes, this great game plan that God is working on. That promise of the paradise land like Eden, of a place where complete justice and righteousness exist, where there will be joy and gladness, thanksgiving and the sound of singing, and ultimately points us forward to the world to come, to the new heavens and, and the new earth. But with Jesus coming the first time, that instruction, that, that gospel, and, and that justice has begun to be spread to the nations. That light has been turned on. The Israel, the islands, the, the nations are beginning to look to Jesus, are awaiting in the hope of his arm, as it says in verse 5, his salvation being revealed. That salvation has in many senses come and remains to be still on the way. And so as we come to the end of this team talk, which I'm going to make now, verses 7 and 8, we who have taken God's instruction, his gospel to heart, may not fear the, the reproach of mere mortals, or be terrified by their insight. We're only part way through the second half of the game, as it were. And we may, may at times feel like 
we're being, we're continually knowing difficulties and discouragement. Our super son, the, the, the servant of God, he has that, that rallying cry has been issued. The game plan has been set out of what is going to happen through history. And those who mock and insult Jesus and, and us as his followers, who light their own torches, who, who follow their own path, Moth will eat them up like a garment. The worm will devour them like wolves came to a But my righteousness will last forever. My salvation through all generations. We're to, we're to take heart. We're to, we're to stay in the game. We're to keep going back to the essential. Super son. We have an awesome game plan. The opposition will crumble. We are on the winning side. That's the, that's the half time team talk that, that Isaiah here has put before us. That I hope will, will spur us on today. If we listen, if we have those ears.